Uh, I've been talking about the way in which God shows up in the parts of our lives that are fun, the, the, the things that we do for fun, that God cares about what we care about. And uh, tonight, I want to talk about some of the biblical grounds for that because a lot of people are, are suspicious. We, we've been raised as Protestants with a, a negative theology of desire, that, that desires are something that we should avoid. And of course, our desires are disordered. They need to be reordered. But we need to, we need to I think, trust the things that we love. Somebody asked me once why you, you chose to be a missionary, and the truth was, my wife and I decided this is what we wanted to do. This is what we desired above everything. So that is how God worked in us. God worked in our desires. So I want to start by thinking about the creation account. I don't think there's a better place to go than to talk about the creation account for a theology of desire. The thing to notice, that, first of all, about the creation account is that God was the first to really enjoy it. When it was finished, God said, it's good, it's very good. So, and I don't think that was just like, well done. I think that's like, he, he enjoyed it. He, he celebrated, he wanted to, 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 to praise it for the work that, that it done because it reflected who he was, especially his creation, it, it, the, the man and the woman in his image. Now, of course, when we turn to the third chapter though, You've all heard the sermons on Genesis chapter 3 when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and the delight to the eyes that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit. You've probably heard as I have had sermons that talk about, you see, what is delight to our eyes and what we desire gets us into trouble. It's, it's a temptation. But if you read the whole account, that's clearly not what that account intends to do. Because the very same combination of words were repeated earlier in chapter two, verse nine, where it says, out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. So in other words, all the trees were made beautiful to be desired, not just the one that was forbidden. So the, the tempter strategy was to ignore this general designation, the excess of creation, all the, all the gifts of creation, and focus on the one thing that was forbidden, that we should, we should not desire. The word there, desire, is the Hebrew word chamad, and it's the same word that's repeated in Exodus 20, 17, that says, you shall not covet, the, really the Hebrew word is their desire. You shall not desire what is in your neighbor's house, your, their neighbor's wife, or anything that is your neighbor's. So the, the desire is not wrong if it's toward what's in your own house. Desire is wrong when it's directed in the wrong direction. So desire is nothing intrinsically wrong. It's about where it's directed. Desire is for, for what is forbidden. Actually, I was just reading the other day, desire is for what is forbidden is, is, is the primary cause of war in traditional societies. Uh, and the book of James says that. You have it, you desire it, you want it, and you war after it because you, you desire it. So especially striking in these accounts is the way images, what is seen and what delights the eyes function within what I want to emphasize is a morally and spiritually and aesthetically charged environment. Creation is a kind of field, force field, in which we are drawn in various directions. And God intended that. That's not bad. That's something that's built into the created order. Our desires are a part of the way God put things together. Well, what about the New Testament? When I was lecturing in Korea, a pastor came to me and said, you talk about desire, but in the New Testament, desire is, is a negative word. Well, it's true that in the New Testament, epithumia is the, is the Greek word for desire. Uh, nine times out of 12, it's used in a negative way. Uh, Paul frequently talks about the desires of the flesh which work, work against the spirit and so on. Though it does appear three times, especially in the Gospels, positively. But it's important that we understand why it has this negative connotation in New Testament times. 
And the reason is because of the Stoic background that Paul inherited. The Stoicism was a, a Platonism that existed during the New Testament in time that looked on the body as, a, as an evil thing that had to be kept under control by reason. And so body, the body was what had these, 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 these desires that have to always be, be put under uh, submission. Because of this tradition, ordinary desires had come to be, uh, have this epithumia came to be seen as a negative thing. The problem is the Stoic tradition conveyed a very negative attitude toward the body and also toward the created goods. But Paul goes out of his way in a number of places to counter this idea. He emphasizes, for example, in his discussion of food offered to idols in 1 Corinthians 8, that it is through Jesus Christ that these good things exist. So the fact that they're being offered to idols is of no concern to us. But even more prominent is his advice to young Timothy. Rather than warning Timothy about the dangers of desires, he, know, he explicitly refers to the Stoic tradition in 1 Timothy 4. He says, they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. This is wrong, Paul says. For these things are created by God, and everything created by God is good, he said, and nothing is to be rejected, provided it be received with thanksgiving. In other words, like all our human impulses, they're disorder. But that's why Paul says that they must be sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Interesting, we would say they need to be disciplined by the word of God and prayer, and they need to be received with thanksgiving. That's what God wants. I don't think God wants much from us other than to be, say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this created gift, and thank you for coming to us in Jesus Christ. Scripture makes clear that though creation is disordered by human sin, it is also transformed by the work and the gift and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to emphasize that because Paul says in Romans 8, the whole creation has been groaning in labor until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for the redemption of the body. So desire, both of the creature and of the person created in the image of God, has a kind of redemptive shape to it. Our desires now represent a desire and longing for a new creation, a renewed creation, and ultimately for the appearance of Christ and the renewal of all things. But it does more than this. It reflects the Bible's claim, the Bible claim, something of God's own yearning for us. James says, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he made to dwell in us. So that the desire we express toward the things that we love and toward the people that we love is an expression and a response to the great desire that God has for us to love us and to be in relationship with us. This then is the theological ground for what I call this poetic theology. Because we are created in the image of God, because of the interconnected goodness of the created order and the redeeming work of Christ and the calling of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit, human projects can not only give meaning to human life, they are significant even to God. Inevitably, celebrations and games Toward point towards something deeper, something that makes sense not only of those things, but of life itself. They reflect the way God has put the world together. Now, if what I'm saying has any, any truth to it, then our ministry has to reflect this. Our ministry has to be concerned with the fears and desires and loves of the people that we're involved in. And the gospel needs to be put in terms of those fears and those desires. 
In, in our culture, there are all kinds of stories that are vying for attention. And the stories that win, the stories that win out, are the stories that resonate with people's desires. They're the stories that resonate with, with their, their longings, the things that they, 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 they yearn for, the things that they dream about. So the gospel must be put into those terms. Now, if I would ask many of you, why is it you became a Christian? You would say, well, I became a Christian because the gospel is true, yes, and because I read it in scripture, but probably it's because of somebody you love. Somebody that you cared about, who shared something with you, and an experience you had that sparked your curiosity about the gospel and turned you in that direction. In other words, the gospel, the story, was put in a way that resonated with things that you cared about and things that you loved. Now, I think this is very important today because, and I don't need to tell you and emphasize this very long because it's, it's common knowledge. Being creative and having an imagination is, is very important to people today. Uh, Robert Withnow has done a very important study, a Princeton sociologist, in which he's argued that people in subsequent generations in the, in the 20th century, every generation, be, has become more involved and interested in the arts. Until he concludes, survey results are consistent with other data showing rising levels of exposure to and participation in the arts. And of course, advertisers are using that. Advertising will say you need to, to use your creative side. You need to express your creative side. If you want to express your creative side, you get this car or you buy these clothes. If you have a real imagination, then you'll drink this Coca-Cola or something. Uh, this, is, this, is what, this is what will make you, you more imaginative, more, more creative. Now, of course, common reaction of a lot of Christians is well say, you see, that reflects the general sort of superficiality of our culture, that we're, uh, we're concerned about surface things. But according to, to Robert Withnow's research, even empirically, that judgment is untrue. Concern for style and aesthetics, his research shows, is correlated with increasing interest in and even seriousness about religious issues. If this is so, then a growing interest in the arts is something to be applauded rather than resisted. The research of Robert Withnow has demonstrated the growing interest in religion is correlated with this and we, for this, we need to be grateful. And I think the reason for this is the arts and, 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 and the things that we love and enjoy open up spaces in our lives for us to hear and listen for God and to know about God's presence. He often found in his research, incidentally, that people made choices on their churches much more for aesthetic reasons than other reasons. I want to come back to that in a little bit. Now, if what I'm saying is true, ministry should be influenced by the aesthetic attractions of people. But here I want to turn my attention now then to the space inside the church. And the question I want to ask is, is the space inside the church a kind of poetic space? Does it, does it really resonate where, with where people are? And I think that you would agree with me many times, it doesn't. It doesn't represent for people a poetic space that they feel drawn to. And of course, there are many reasons for that in the Reformation where all the images and all that's, that, that's uh, with the visual was swept out of the church. We, we, we all know that and we understand that. But I want to emphasize the fact that in spite of that, we still long, even us Protestants, we still long to stand before a beautiful picture, to stand and watch the sunset, to sit quietly in prayer. In spite of all that smartphones and 24-hour social media can do, we still long for quiet. We still long for the, for the beauty of 
what scriptures call the beauty of holiness. This is what I call contemplation that we need to allow back into our churches and back into our spirituality. Spirituality is, uh, uh, contemplation is, is called turning towards something in love and affirmation. As John Navone said, there can be no true love without approving contemplation. Spiritual contemplative practices take us further to stimulate what might be called an active awareness of the presence of God. I'd like to, to talk for a few minutes about the way in which scripture encourages this kind of active awareness of the presence of God. I've been recently struck by the, way, the fact that, that much of scripture which is the law or, or the commands of scripture is, is put right smack in the middle of these kind of aesthetic images of the smoke and fire and visions of God that are not simply narrative, but aesthetic events in scripture. I don't think we pay enough, enough attention to that. Uh, I'm struck by that because we're also biblical, you know? We're, we're biblical people, aren't we? And yet we don't pay much attention to these, these sort of central visions that exist in, in scripture. For, for example, take Isaiah chapter six. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. You notice how the vision of God for Isaiah in chapter 6 did not turn him away from the world, but it turned him toward it. It was what stimulated him to say later, here am I, Lord, send me. Now, of course, in all your missionary conferences, you've heard sermons on here am I, send me. But when have we had a sermon that, that, that focuses on this vision that asks us to indwell that vision, to imagine the Lord, to imagine God high and lifted up. And let our, let our artistic imagination bring us closer to the reality of God and his glory. I don't think that Isaiah meant us to, to, to look at that vision and then just get on with our work. I think and that, I think this, perhaps this is why it's in the sixth chapter and not in the first chapter, but he wants us to indwell that vision. I think that scripture wants us, the, the, the scripture writers, writers want us to take that vision with us into our life in the world and to live with it. There was a medieval practice that's called Lexio Divina and maybe some of you have studied it in your spiritual practices, courses. But what strikes me about that is what the Lectio Divina does is allows you to focus on the aesthetic elements of scripture in such a way that they move you and motivate you to draw you closer to God and to a vision of God. Let me take another example. Revelation chapter one. John, while in exile in Patmos, I saw, John said, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash upon his, upon his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters. And, and John said, I fell as though I were dead. In other words, the only res proper response to such a vision is to be knocked cold. You know, when I was thinking about this passage, 
I sat in the Fuller Library and I started taking down commentaries. And I think I checked 22 or 23 commentaries on this passage. Every one of them talked about this means this. This is a reference to the Old Testament book of the Song of Solomon. This is a, the, 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 the sun means this. It was all about what this, what this means, the cognitive meaning of it. Only one, George Caird said, the point of this is to set your imagination alive, to set your imagination going. It's to make you imagine what it would be like to stand in the presence of God. And if you do that, will change your life. It will change your life because you'll understand what God is like. Why is it that we really need to return to such a vision? Well, because as the image of God, this experience represents the end for which we were made. As the image of God, as made in the likeness of God, we are made ultimately to see God does not yet appear what we will be, but we know when he will appear, John says, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. You see, such a vision addresses you on many levels. Yes, you can think about it, and you can think about the meaning, but you also ne need to indwell it. You need to, to, to feel it. It's, it's an event that, that's symbolized by the idea of Shabbat, the Sabbath. Shabbat in, in Hebrew means to stop. And Sabbath, the idea of celebrating Sabbath was to stop. Why do you stop? Stop so you can indwell the vision of God. Stop so you can realize what it is to be a part of the family of God. Stop so that you can be a part of something bigger than yourself. Strikes me this is what people want. This is what they're calling for. And here's the challenge. At the very time when our culture is calling for us to be more creative and more, more imaginative, too often our churches are not filled with the kind of poetic realities and the poetic performances, the kind of visions that scripture elicits. Why should our performance be limited to preaching? Why shouldn't we call for a larger, a larger performance of, of the sacraments, of singing, of dancing, and all, all kinds of performances in our spaces, so that those, they become poetic spaces that attract people to the gospel. But in order for this to happen, we first, as God's people, must recover this robust sense of the, the poetic dimension of our lives those objects and practices that recognize, construct, and celebrate relationships. Those relationships in which we've been created, our connections with each other, with creation, and ultimately with God. In the church, the proclamation of the word and the Eucharist are central symbols of this presence. And they're also, I think, foundational for our understanding of our poetics. They are the ultimate and foundational poetic reality because they celebrate and represent God's presence in our lives, his gift of grace in our lives. Though Christians differ over precise meanings of that, we all agree that these events are central to our lives. These symbols and their performance connect us with each other with the saints that have gone by, past, gone by in past times, with those out inside and outside the church, with the whole created order, they are symbols that represent reconciliation, hospitality, nourishment, both physical and spiritual, which are to, in, to influence all of life. They make the space of the church into a, a poetic space. But if this is so, Participation in this dynamic practice should enable us as believers not only to live a morally transformed life, yes, we want that, but also to, to open us to, to, to the, the reality of, of beauty in the world around us, 
and the ability to create beauty out of spaces and object and relationships that are around us. It should enable worshipers not only to do good, but to see it and enjoy it. Living inside of God's imagination means constructing and reconstructing the world according to the figural splendor that creation embodies and the beauty toward which the spirit is moving it. Surely Christians are not the only ones to recognize the splendor of the sunset or the wonder of great art. But if the church of Jesus Christ does not stimulate us in us, appreciation of these things, then it is not the church of Christ the creator. For God not only endowed creation with great beauty, but gave us the ability to celebrate it and enjoy it. Why not extend this poetic practice into all the parts of our lives? Would not that attract the attention of our secular neighbors who, like us, are seeking to build a beautiful life for themselves? I think it would. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.